We do thank you, Lord, because um, here we are, as much as we may look around the world and see strife and struggles and problems, we can say that you have provided us our daily bread faithfully forever. And uh, for that, we are so thankful and grateful. And we know, Lord, that there are those who live in fear and anxiety around the world, those who live in want. Uh, what we offer is uh, little when you compare to the world's problems, but it is great in that it is given freely and lovingly from generous hearts. So bless these gifts, Lord, and take them to use them to bring joy to those who may not know joy, to bring love to those who may not know love, to bring peace to those who may not know peace. And may you be glorified in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us share some.
its own, because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that said, I said to you, servants are not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It was to fulfill the word that is, is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Words of love and words of grace. Thanks 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 you. You. Wow. So we're, we're um, two weeks away from Easter now. And... Uh, that means that if you've given up anything, uh, chocolate, beer, uh, whatever it may be, rock and roll, I'm not sure. But whatever you've given up, it's almost time that you can stop giving it up, right? You can go back after Easter. But uh, of course, you know that as a Christian, you really don't just go through these cycles of giving up and then taking on. It's a, it's a lifetime walk. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the Lenten journey that we we go on every year historically that was a time when um, people who were ready to join the faith new converts were preparing uh, as far as discipline goes they were preparing for baptism 
and preparing to enter the church. So it was really, you know, kind of a, a, a like a military sort of a thing. You know, you're you're going through the Lenten journey, but once you're there, it doesn't mean okay, let up and everything's um, you know back to the way it was. No, it's again your your Christian walk is a continuous walk. It's a it's hopefully a a progress and not like one and you know an annual okay here's Lent and then back to normal and Lent and then back to normal no it's 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 continuous growth continuous growth and um, you know for the life of Christian the life of a Christian is all about nurturing love within you nurturing love within you John's gospel is so much about love it's that expression of love we all know, you know, if there's one New Testament verse that everybody knows, but for those who want it simple, they go with Jesus wept because it's only two words, <laughs> you know, okay, I got that. But what do we think of John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave us his son and whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So love is like a real key to John's gospel. And uh, we are to love each other as Jesus loved us, and the Father loved Jesus, and the Spirit loved us, and the, the we and God and the Spirit and Jesus are all mixed together into this great pot of love. And that's how we live our lives as Christians. They'll know we are Christians by our love. And that was a that was a truth of uh, of ancient world. It was a very much of a of a conundrum for many of the Romans uh, and people in Rome, because here were these Christians who were not making sacrifices to the Roman gods who were, but nonetheless, they were great people. They were doing all these good deeds. And these like Roman leaders were saying, what do I do with these Christians? They're actually pretty nice people. They're just not following the rules right here. Um, and of course, we know that there's a long history of what happened. You know, there were, a lot of them were killed. A lot of them were, were suffered for their commitment to the cross, to, to Jesus Christ. But the spirit that dwells in us is the spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of God, which is the spirit of love. And yet, we Christians, like Jesus uh, mentions, we are often hated rather than love. And we're often hated because we love, because we love. In today's lesson, Jesus mentions, you know, that, that um, if, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. And we struggle with this because no one I know really wants to be hated. Everybody wants to be loved. We want to be loved by people. Um, but the question is, what must we do? First of all, what is love? What is true love? And what do we compromise so often in order to be approved of by other people? Um, but we should expect as Christians that yes, there are going to be times when we're going to be hated, when we are going to be hated. You know, there's a, there's a story, it's a bit of a legend about John Wesley. It's probably not historically true, but it could be because it matches his character. So one day John Wesley is riding along on his horse and uh, He's noticed that it's been three days since anybody threw anything at him, since anybody <laughs> did anything that indicated they didn't like John Wesley. And uh, so he says, oh, maybe I've neglected something. Maybe I have not, maybe I've sinned. And I just don't know about it. So the story is he gets off his horse and he starts praying. And meanwhile, over the uh, other side of the hedge, there is a farmer who sees him, recognizes who he is, and picks up a brick, <laughs> tosses it over. This is John Wesley, but John's like, oh, he got an affirmation. Oh, good, I'm not sinning. I must be doing something right. <laughs> Somebody threw a brick at me. Uh, but that, you know, that's kind of a, it's an exaggeration. But it is kind of the way John Wesley lived his life. He, he came close to death many a time uh, because of his zeal for Jesus Christ. And that is a struggle. I mean, that's just an existential struggle for us. We don't like bricks being thrown at us. We don't like being in harm's way. We don't like even being unpopular at times. Um, and so we struggle with this. Um, and the world, you know, when we talk about John saying that the world 
hates you. I should probably define what the world is. And, and uh, that is really the way of, the way things operate around us, the way people manage, which is very often about um, getting what's yours, getting what we need. It's very self-driven. Even if we have other people who are our leaders, even if we elect other leaders, and unlike this, we often get behind that leader for our own protection. We do it for our own safety. We do it because we feel safe and secure in that. And so very, very much our, our, uh, the world is very self-motivated. And um, you know, for whatever the pros and cons are of our system of capitalism, none like this, uh, it, it's a bit greed-driven very often. It's like, I can make a good life for myself if I do this and do that. And I don't judge that, but I'm just pointing out that very much of it is re-driven. And, and, and you know, going back to, when we look at what's going on in the Ukraine today, a lot of us, our minds are flashing back to the Cold War and this whole ideological fight between communism and they would say democracy, but very often it's communism and capitalism that really uh, in competition. And the, the, the failure of communism was the fact that it had great ideals, but the human heart wasn't ready for it. The human heart couldn't live with an idea of, of uh, giving up its something of its own for something bigger than itself, which was, in that case, the state. But um, greed, greed entered the system, and it corrupted the system, and it demotivated a lot of people. So the way of the world is a way of really, of, of self-seeking, self-power, self-protection. And it's one that does focus a lot upon, on our fears. It, it's a result of our fears. Even hatred is the result of our fears. Dr. Robert Sternberg, who's a professor of, of human development at Cornell University, has written about this and studied the phenomenon of hate. And he recognizes three elements in hate. Uh, the first one, he says, is a negation of intimacy. A negation of intimacy, what that means is you create a distance when closeness becomes threatening. You create a distance when closeness becomes threatening. But the second thing, as he says, is it's an infusion of passion, such as fear and anger. The third, he says, is it's a decision to devalue someone or something that was previously valued. Okay, you bring something down. That, that is to hate. Okay, and looking at these three elements, in the context of Jesus in the first century, we can kind of see what was going on in the Bible story and how Jesus talking about the world hating you, how that fit into his own life story. Let's remind ourselves that Jesus was executed as an enemy to the Roman Empire. Also, the high priests looked upon Jesus as a threat to their way of life. He called into question the religious practices of the priests and, and the people who followed them. So this was a, a threat. This resulted in hate. Well, the, you know, the second element of hatred I mentioned was this infusion of passion such as fear and anger. There was obviously a lot of fear and anger that came from the religious authorities toward Jesus. But there was also fear and anger about the message of the coming of God's kingdom, uh, this, you know, this great and terrible day of the Lord that Jesus was talking about. God is coming, the kingdom is coming, judgment is coming, and that can evoke a lot of fear. Even for people today, that kind of fear comes through. And also Jesus was proclaiming a major change in the way that the world was being run. He was calling people to look upon themselves in a new way, to change, to transform, to convert, to, uh, you know, to, to, to be saved, as, as we would say, but to repent and believe. Major sea change he's calling on. 
And nobody likes change. Change makes us uncomfortable. Change can make us angry. Change can make us fearful. The new life was radically different than the kind of life that people are used to living. Forgiving others, serving others, putting yourself last instead of first, these were huge changes and people were not ready for that kind of change. They were fearful of that kind of change. They were angry about the prospect of that kind of change. Well, the third element of hatred was the decision to devalue something that was previously valued. And, you know, clearly, clearly Jesus's life had no positive value to the Romans at that point, or the priesthood. They considered him to be a threat. They devalued him to the point of death, basically. And even though Judaism, Judaism itself, attaches a great high value to human life, but nonetheless, Jesus was considered a great threat to that whole community. Again, we were talking about that this morning in the Richard Moore book study. What Caiaphas says, according to uh, John's gospel, there was a, a lot of truth to that. It said, better that one man die than a whole nation should perish. There was fear that Jesus' message and Jesus' radical change that he was calling about was going to incur the wrath of Rome, and no one could stand up to that. The Jewish nation could not stand up to that. They tried in 70 AD, and they got squashed. So you know, this was a, a legitimate fear of what was going on there. And because of what Jesus was saying, because of what Jesus was doing, he was hated. He was hated. But then came Easter, right? After the crucifixion, then came Easter. Then came this idea of resurrection, this whole phenomena. When God revalued Jesus, you know, in, and basically brought him from death to life. And so we strive. We strive to be the people that call, God calls us to be. And people who have the same spirit, we have the same spirit in us that inhabited Jesus. A spirit that unfortunately the world still hates. And some of you may be, be saying to yourself, well, you know, the world doesn't really hate Jesus or the Christians, but I would say maybe the world has devalued Jesus and the Christians. Um, what is the world's understanding of who Jesus is? If we make Jesus out to just be this prophet who uh, came with a great message of love, who died at the hands of Rome, uh, you know, an unfortunately sad story for a Jew, then then we don't hate Jesus. We, we just simply feel sorry for him and his ending, and that's the end of the story. And the world, many people in the world have made Jesus into that poor, tragic human being. And therefore, you know, there's no hate. There's more pity than anything else. But if you recognize Jesus as we Christians recognize him, as the Son of God, whose spirit dwells in us, the spirit of truth that dwells in us, and that we are commissioned to proclaim resurrection, Jesus is alive, Christ is risen, praise be to God. If, if we are to do that, and if we are holding on to that belief, that is offensive to a lot of people. That does offend a lot of people because it goes right back to the first century and that call, that radical call to change our lives, to alter our whole value system into a way that values the life of others, that values the dignity of others, that values the, the rights of others and, the, and all of that. And, and we're, we're called to that. And so, where is the Christian hated in the world? The Christian is hated where the Christian stands with the poor and the marginalized, the people who are suffering. When the Christian stands and says, this is not right, this needs to change, if this person is a human being, needs to be treated as such. It's hated. And even we talked about that, even in the church, there's, there's a bit of hatred going on because of, um, because of people who are 
who are excluded, people who are marginalized, the church excludes and marginalizes. So we are called to do that, and we're gonna, we're gonna face hate. We're gonna face it. But the good news is that there are enough of those, enough of us, who are receiving this message. There are enough of us that we are here to encourage one another, to prompt one another, to uh, inspire one another, to go on this very difficult road that involves hatred. And we're going to do it together. And we're not going to respond to hate with hate. We don't do that. We respond to hate with love, as we should. And that's good. And that is good. The best way to do what Christ calls us to do, which does involve the, the, the threat of being hated, but it is to introduce others to God. It is to introduce others to the source of our love, to the power of our love, and to the vision of Jesus of a kingdom of God that dwells currently, right now, presently, and here, and here, and there, and in our hearts, and to expand that to a world that is so prone to hatred, to expand that, to help people see in a new way, in an alternate way, rather than the way of the world. Um, I just share a little story that I had about that hatred. Um, so in winter time, and I was a sales rep and I'm parked in a parking lot and I'm lazy, I'm lazy, I'll admit it, I'm lazy. <laughs> but uh, so it's snow, there's snow on my windows and I'm in a hurry to get home. So instead of clearing off all my windows so I can see, I said, oh, all I need is a little spot in the front, <laughs> a little spot in the back and I'll be able to see just fine. I'll be able to go down the road five miles an hour and everything will be fine. Except coming out of the parking lot, I didn't notice that there was a car coming from the side as I'm just cruising along forward, oblivious to anyone on either side of me. I get along and this car honks and I'm like this and I roll down my window and I just see somebody just cursing me out right and left, you know. What's wrong with you? Don't clear your windows. And, um, you know, thought went through my mind, well, maybe I should just roll up my window and go on. But now I said, you're right. I should have done that. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I just kind of caught it. I so, <laughs> didn't know what to say at that point. I, I was humbling myself. I was wrong. I admit it. I'm not going to put up a fight just for putting up a fight. No, no, I put that. But, you know, okay, so that was a mild witness of humility. Simply saying, yeah, I'm not perfect. I'm, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm not perfect. Um, but yeah, just to be able to do that and to do that on a grand scale um, to confront the anger of the world, to confront the hatred of the world, to confront all of that with just a love and an understanding that um, we're all works in progress. I'm one of the main ones. Um, but we all are works in progress. We can all be humble and we can all just simply love um, despite what the result might be. But definitely, you know, when it comes to the poor, the marginalized people who are truly suffering because of uh, the greed of others, the selfishness of others, the, the, uh, the authority of others, um, we do have a calling, Jesus calls us, to speak, to act on their behalf. Do so lovingly, do so lovingly, and do so with understanding. And know that those people who are opposing you, uh, they're not doing it because they're big and bad, they're doing it because they're scared, because they have fears that prompt their anger. And that one thing we can do as Christians is to assuage their fears, to... to um, Take that away from you. To understand that when you live your life in God, there is nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear. So let us go on forward, you know, as we go into uh, this Easter season, remembering, you know, that, that we have nothing to fear, uh, that we are called to love. Yes, we will be hated, but praise God, there will be those who will come to come to know God's love, and we can celebrate that. Let us pray. Lord, we, um, 
we so often have that knee-jerk reaction, which is just when, when somebody expresses uh, anger or hatred toward us, our response can be to hate back. Um, our response to the injustice that occurs in our world, it can be outrage, but that can also be tinged with hatred, hatred for the oppressor. And we're not called to hate. We recognize that the world is not where it needs to be, that the kingdom is still on its way. And so we pray for the patience, that we can look at the anger around us, that we can see the hatred around us, and not respond in like, but respond with compassion, knowing that uh, ultimately it's the result of fear. It's the result of uh, people not knowing your love, which pretty much clears us of all our fears. So help us, O oh Lord. Help us to grow closer to you, that we may be a bolder and bolder witness and be able to face uh, whatever hatred the world might throw at us, but doing so with love, with understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>